briefly. My name is Thomas Mueller. I'm the Director of Applications Development for the AFM Business at Booker. And uh, I would like to welcome you today to this installment of the Brook AFM webinar series. This presentation here is titled In Situ, In Operando, Peak Force Tapping Imaging of Lithium Ion Batteries in a Glove Box. It will be presented jointly by Sinjang Shao from GM, Ravi Kumar from Brown University, and Teddy Huang from Brooker. Before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to make a few quick logistical comments. First, we encourage your participation during the webinar. If you have a question, please type it into the questions dialog box on your screen. We will accumulate these questions through the presentation, group them together, and then answer them at the end of the prepared remarks. Quite often, we have more questions than we can answer in the session, and in those cases, we'll be sure to follow up by email. Also, if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or pass it to a colleague, the webinar will be posted online within a week in the webinar section of the Booker webpage. As a follow-up to this presentation, you'll also be receiving an email with this link. Finally, when you exit the webinar software, you'll be asked to take a brief survey. We'd very much appreciate it if you would take the time to complete this, as it helps us pick the topics that are most important to you and generally make the series better. So let's get started and let me introduce our three presenters. First, uh, Dr. Sinjang Shao is a staff scientist at General Motors Global R&D Center. He obtained his PhD degree from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He worked as a research associate at the Argonne National Laboratory and Brown University before joining General Motors in 2006. He has published over 130 peer-reviewed journal papers and has 34 granted patent and over 30 pending patent applications in different fields. He's the recipient of the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship in 2001, the 2013 R&D 100 Award, the 2013 SME Innovations That Could Change the Way We Manufacture, and he's a 2015 R&D 100 Award finalist. Um, second, uh, Ravi Kumar, our second guest speaker, is a PhD student in materials engineering at Brown University. He obtained his bachelor's degree from IIT Kanpur, India in 2008. After that, he worked at Tata R&D in India for three years before joining Brown University. The focus of his PhD thesis is on failure mechanisms of lithium-ion batteries based on both thin film and practical composite architectures. Finally, uh, Teddy Huang, our Brooker presenter, is a senior application scientist at Brooker's AFM unit. He obtained his PhD degree in physical chemistry from Emory University in 2012. After graduation, he worked with Professor Nathan Lewis at Caltech as a postdoctoral scholar, where he investigated the semiconductor metal interfacial structure using AFM nanoscale electrical measurements. He joined Brooker in 2014 and now leads the team for development of AFM-based electrical and electrochemical applications. And today, he's published more than 30 peer-reviewed articles with more than 1,400 citations. So let's turn it over now to our presenters, starting with Dr. Shao to begin this presentation titled In Situ, In Operando, Peak Force Tapping Imaging of Lithium-Ion Batteries in a Glove Box. Uh, thank you, Tom, um, for your introduction. Uh, here, I would like to give a, a brief introduction about the background and how in-situ FM can help us um, develop advanced electrical materials. And from this slide, uh, we can see the uh, challenge of meeting future global fuel economy and the carbon dioxide requirements is really substantial. Uh, on the emissions front, Europe, uh, the U.S., and China are all adopting progressive requirements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And by um, 2025, uh, like U.S. has to meet the requirements of 54.5 uh, miles per gallon for the vehicles. So from the automotive industry point of view, we have to further develop the traditional internal combustion engine technologies to improve the fuel efficiency and at the same time to electrify the automobile in order to meet the strict requirements. So here are just a few examples of GM's efforts on electrification, particularly 
We just announced a new all-electric concept Chevrolet Bolt, which can achieve a 200-mile uh, electric driving range per charge. So in order to further extend the driving range, we have to explore the new electric materials with higher capacity for higher energy density. Here is just a chart showing uh, different electric materials are available. As you can see, silicon has the highest specific capacity, 10 times higher than graphite. However, nothing comes free. The high capacity introduces huge volume expansion and contraction, uh, leading to the coupled mechanical and chemical degradation and different material levels, including the uh, mechanical fracture, unstable SGI or solid electrolyte interface formed on silicon surface, and poor electrode integrity. Uh, if we look back at the USAPC requirements, the battery has to have 10 years life and can cycle at least 1,000 cycles. Um, for that, the cycle efficiency has to be above 99.99%. Uh, in order to achieve that, we have to really stabilize both SGI and silicon active material. Uh, we know the SGI or solid electrolyte interface is a critical activation layer which can uh, enable the battery to be cycled for long term. Uh, basically, it's a byproduct deposit on the active material surface due to the composition of liquid electrolyte. So, uh, different formation cycle, electrolyte additives or temperature could lead to uh, different composition. Um, so, our goal is really trying to really correlate the composition and the mechanical uh, properties and electrochemical behaviors with battery performance. Before doing that, we really have to uh, address a couple of critical questions, like which SGI compounds or components are desirable, and how can we modify or control the SGI, and how the mechanical deformation influences the SGI uh, life, and how does the SGI evolve during recycling. Particularly for silicon, it has up to 300% of volume expansion. And how can we really stabilize SCI on the silicon surface is really a great challenge for us. We have done some initial mechanics analysis which shows that there might be three possible failure mechanisms, uh, including like the SCI uh, formed on the fracture surface, SCI peels from the silicon surface uh, during the deletization de process, and the, also the SCI buckling from the uh, silicon during the decision process. So based on the fracture mechanics, we were able to obtain the relationship about the critical size and some critical parameters like the, uh, from the SGI and from the silicon. Um, for those material properties and the mechanical properties, there is no straightforward approach can mirror them based on the conventional approach. However, this in situ electrochemical FM capabilities um, enable us to capture some critical information, such as the, how the silicon expand and contact during cycling and different SOC, and how it evolves um, during the initial cycle and how it feels. It really can provide us some guidance for further uh, designing the ACI and the silicon and the whole system. So without further ado, I will pass to Teddy, who will give a detailed explanation about this technique. Um, thanks, Bing Chen, for the introduction of the battery research and also the introduction about the AFM applications for battery research. So in this section, I will talk about Luca AFM solutions to this complex material and engineering system. The highly multidisciplinary nature of the battery research poses ground challenges for material categorization. Information of interest is multidimensional including topography, mechanics, electricity, electrochemistry, etc. More importantly, these properties should be measured in situ, in operando, and under ambience controls. Today, Blue could provide a versatile array of techniques to make this demand. For example, 
based on the tip sample force interaction, one can measure the mechanical properties of the sample. By constructing the tip sample on sample as an electrical component into a circuit, one can measure a variety of electrical properties of the sample. The tip itself can be used as one of the electro in the electrochemical system for doing electrochemistry on sub-100 nanometer scales, taking the advantage, advantage of high resolution AFM. In addition, the tip can be also used as an antenna for near-field optical microscopy. In today's talk, you will see an example on how Brooker AFM is used for in situ in operando of lithium ion battery studies under the controlled ambient. In 2009, Brooker released a new AFM imaging mode called peak force tapping. In peak force tapping, the probe is modulated at 1 to 2 kHz at a low frequency and use a very small amplitude, which is typically about 100 nanometer or less. For topographic imaging, the feedback signal now is the maximum force of peak force between the tip and the sample. If you think about the motion of the probe in terms of the Z position, we are essentially performing a triggered force curve at every tapping cycle. However, we are using sinusoidal ramping instead of linear ramping. As such, the tip velocity approaches zero as the tip approaches the surface. This really, this really help, um, this really allows for direct peak force control, and therefore peak force tapping is easily able to use ultra low set points, such as below 100 piconewton and even below 50 piconewton. This really helps to protect the tip and the sample from potential damages and really enables high resolution imaging. Also, to modulate the tip at about 1 to 2 kilohertz, it allows for imaging at high scan rate and high pixel resolution. In peak force tapping, the peak force control is linear, which allows the scan assist mode. Scan assist is the first AFM imaging mode with automated image optimization technology. In scan assist, intelligent algorithms continuously monitor image quality to make appropriate parameter adjustments so that extremely high quality images can be produced by any user regardless of experience level. Peak force tapping has also enabled peak force QNM or quantitative nanomechanical properties mapping because we're essentially collecting force curve at every pixel of the image. We can use this curve to obtain quantitative nanomechanical properties across the sample surface. For example, modulus, adhesion, deformation, and dissipation that directly correlate to the topographic data channel. So, on the, so at the bottom left is an example of peak force imaging of a fragile SEI layer in electrolyte. To avoid scratching this layer, a stable sub-nanonewton force control in liquid environment is required. This stable sub-nanonewton force control in liquid is challenging for both contact mode and the traditional tapping mode. Well, it is very routine for peak force tapping. At the bottom right, it is a peak force QNN example. So it shows the it shows decreased modulus and increased deformation of the silicon anode surface during the growth of the fragile SEI layer. In addition to the peak force QNM, peak force tapping has also been integrated with a variety of AFM, AFM modes for electrical, electrochemical and spectroscopic measurement. This greatly expands their applications to previously impossible measurements on fragile samples and also provides the simultaneous mapping of correlated mechanical properties. Electrical AFM with peak force tapping is used for the lithium ion, the lithium ion battery project in today's webinar. In this mode, the AFM performs peak force imaging on a working electrochemical system Shown here is an example from a silicon anode in the form of micro island. Peak force EC AFM imaging shows operando volume change during this Asian process. The fast scan icon 
AFM shown here is what we have used for this battery project. This platform supports numerous modes to accommodate today's highly multidisciplinary energy and material research, such as battery, battery research. The 210 millimeter vacuum truck is loaded on an XY motorized stage. The stage has repeatability better than three microns, more often better than one micron. Software allows to remember the sample location so that you can always come back to revisit the same location. The motorized control, together with the PIC4 tagging, makes this fast scan icon platform well suited for electrochemical applications, in particular for lithium battery work. Since the system under investigation is sensitive to air and water, ambient control is naturally required. A straightforward solution, as shown on this slide, is to integrate our AFM with a guard box. This guard box integration, um, this guard box itself is capable of providing atmospheric isolation by a controlled, non-reactive environment of less than 1 ppm water and oxygen content. The, customer, the customized design also takes care of vibration and acoustic noise with an active vibration table in the guard box. Here is an overall view of the electrochemical setup. The electrochemical cell magnetically attaches to the truck. Electrical connections are mixed through the truck base and spring terminals. The liquid probe holder with a splash shield is designed to keep the scanner tube, keep the scanner tube from coming into contact with the liquid in the cell. Here is a closer view of the uh, EC configuration. Several key points. I mean, first, all parts must be chemically compatible to, uh, with the system that you are investigating. As such, we have a probe holder with a KLF body and a KLRAS boot. As for the cell, the EC cell has a glass cover, KLRAS O-ring, and a KLF Teflon body. Second, since we are operating experiments, that is, we are running AFM inside a guard box, the assembly needs to be easy. Third, as battery cycling can take hours or even days, it is so designed to avoid solvent evaporation that a closed cell is formed when probe is engaged with the sample. From here, I would like to turn the presentation to Ravi and he will show you some exciting results we've recently had regarding the SEI formation, evolution, and the failure mechanism. Thanks, Ching Cheng and Teddy for giving an overview of lead-land batteries and ECFM capability of Brooker. In this section, I'll talk about in situ AFM study of failure mechanisms of solid electrolyte interface in lithium ion batteries. So the main questions that we want to address are like uh, mainly dealing with mechanics of the SEI layer. There has been a lot of efforts to characterize the chemistry of the SEI layer, but there has been very few efforts on the mechanical properties of the SEI layer, like elastic modulus or fracture toughness, or how does the SEI layer fail? Does it crack? Does it delaminate or does it fall off? So uh, for utilization of high capacity materials like silicon, which go through huge volume expansion and contraction, it is important to understand how these uh, SEI layer evolves and uh, fails during cycling. So uh, apart from these, the knowledge of failure modes of SEI is very important. So these kind of information about elastic modulus and fracture toughness or failure mechanisms of SEI layer will be very helpful in tailoring the SEI properties so that it can withstand high strains in high capacity materials. So to understand these kind of questions or answer these kind of questions, we have used a pattern silicon 
patterned silicon island architecture which is very uh, which is very similar to a commercial 3d particle like a, a nanoparticle or uh, micro size particles because it goes to goes through a 3d expansion and contraction so what we want to we want to utilize the lateral sliding of these patterned silicon architecture to apply strain in the SEI layer and as it cycles we can we know that how much strain in the SEI layer is and try to track if there is a failure of the SEI layer so this slide really shows that what happens during lithiation during lithiation these patterned silicon islands will like expand and contract both laterally and perpendicular to the surface direction which puts the strain in the top layer uh, which puts the SEI in the top in strain and that can cause failure so this is what we really want to track through ECAFM capability at Brooker which can give us high resolution imaging so to do this what we use is quartz wafer as our substrate uh, a titanium bonding layer and a copper as our current collector and using photolithography we deposit amorphous silicon islands which are dimension is 15 micrometer by 15 micrometer lateral dimension and the thickness is almost 225 nanometers so this is uh, very much based on the sear lag model which explains that the there is a sear lag zone which there is a sear lag zone to balance the forces or the ba balance the stress in the material which can slide in the current collector so this is this theory we are utilizing in this kind of structure to answer these SEI related questions so in terms of AFM setup although Teddy already mentioned that we are using uh, this kind of cell assembly which is very easy to make inside club box and uh, so you, what you can see is that we have lithium on the top just below the uh, glass uh, or quartz window and then we, uh, we have a sample at the bottom of the cell and then the, we fill the whole cell with electrolyte and then we bring the probe or like the tip of the uh, AFM to close the cell so that it is like completely closed cell and there is no evaporation of the electrolyte. So this is the cell that we use, uh, lithium as counter electrode and reference electrode, the pattern silicon island as our working electrode, and we connect wires so that wires to the uh, working electrode and lithium to make the connections from the potential stack. So now I will come to the uh, now I will come to the results section. So in this slide I want to show that how pattern silicon island evolves as we lithiate and delithiate the sample so this is a movie which I will which is made from a succession of AFM images taken at different voltages during lithiation and delithiation so the voltage during lithiation and delithiation is mentioned at the top left corner and uh, the scale of scale bar is mentioned here so I'm going to play this movie and you can see that how the island uh, expands and contracts. So what you can see is that during lithiation, the, the island expands laterally parallel to the substrate other than also expanding perpendicular to the substrate. And uh, this as you, as you saw, I will try to stop at some place where you can see what really happened to the SEI layer. So, sorry, uh, I want to stop at some point. Right here. Oh, sorry. So, what I really wanted to show you is that because of this lateral expansion, there is enough strain in the SEI layer and it results into the failure it results into the failure mainly in the corner region because that's a point where the expansion and contraction is really into a 3D mode, 3D mode of deformation. So it is like X and Y and then G deformation, which is, but like if you see like most of the cracking that happened is like two corners, which were like sharp corners. So this kind of geometry is still very relevant for understanding what would happen if I was using a silicon nanoparticle or if I was using a micro size silicon particle so this is like very much similar to that kind of uh, this captures that kind of deformation so in the next slide what I wanted to show you is that the tracking of the height changes during the first cycle so 
what you can see is that initially we start with almost 225 nanometer thickness and there is two things so like the center of the island and edge of the islands behave differently why because of as i discussed before there is a shear lag reason which is limited in the edge reason which which goes through both lateral expansion and contraction and vertical expansion and contraction so because of that lateral sliding the edge goes through a lower height change compared to the center of the island so another thing to note from this is that although the center height is low sorry the edge height is lower compared to the center of the island after we completely delithiate the edge of the island shows higher height compared to the center of the island which suggests that there is more asi formation at the edge compared to the center of the island due to this deformation so this this is this is probably most probably due to the stretching of the asi layer which results into eg access of electrolyte to the fresh silicon surface and or easier conduction of electrons to the surface of asi resulting into more electrolyte decomposition products and asi build up at the edge so previously uh, there is another paper from anton tokarno which was published in 2014 which showed like how like uh, asi evolves mainly evolution of the asi layer so you can refer to that paper also for more information on this kind of studies so another thing to note is that in like after first cycle we form almost like 300 nanometer of asi after the first cycle so this this total irreversible change in height could be due to two things one is asi and there is another uh, aspect which is irreversible volume expansion of silicon due to voids or some leftover lithium so but that was accounted for by uh anton in his earlier paper which says that there is almost like 15% irreversible volume expansion due to void formation or irreversible lithium uh if we take into that also account it is like almost 300 na still 300 nanometer of asi after our first cycle so what we wanted to do is that uh so we formed some cracks in the first cycle now we wanted to understand that how these cracks evolve after we keep cycling it because it's not just the first cycle which is of interest you want to cycle it thousand cycles so what does these cracks do as we lithiate and delithiate further so this is another movie which shows that during the second cycle how these cracks how these cracks evolve or like what happens to the other regions of the asi layer so i am playing this movie and you can see the voltage up at the left corner so what you can really see is that apart from the corner cracks which which grow into the material there are cracks in the edge regions which also start appearing so and these cracks like during lithiation they open up because of the tensile stress in the asi film at the top and while we are delithiating the sample it starts to close because of the compressive stress in the asi layer so this really shows and one thing other than this you can see is that the cracks in the corner are more severe compared to the cracks in the edge region this is mainly due to the change in deformation mode so in these regions your mode of deformation is three dimensional but like in this region it is mainly like x and g direction so it is like 2d deformation so this gives a good overview of that if the deformation is 2d versus 3d what kind of asi deformation or asi failure you will really see at these kind of sites so like let uh, later i also wanted to track what is the height changes or is there like because of further deformation at the edge regions how did the height evolve so can we track new asi formation at the edge or the center so you can see the black curve represents the height evolution at the center and the blue curve represents the height evolution at the edge what you can see is that in the second cycle the height revolution is very reversible at the center so it almost comes back to the same position after delithiation 
but like height at the edge is still keeps evolving which suggests that because of this deformation because of this stretching of the SEI layer in mainly in the edge region we have more new SEI formation so now uh, we can quantify a lot of things from these cycling information one important thing to quantify is that how much lateral sliding we have in this kind of island so based on all these succession of images from AFM we can track how much the island size changed laterally so what we saw is that during both cycle 1 and cycle 2 there is almost like 10 to 11 percent lateral sliding which almost accounts for like one to two micrometers of lateral sliding which puts like this is this SEI layer at a lot of strain so now we want we also wanted to see that how the roughness of this island surface evolves with respect to cycling so what you can notice is that during the first cycle like although during the first cycle because of a lot of SEI formation you see hues increase sudden increase of uh, roughness at the center and also in the edge region because of the SEI formation almost at 0.6 volt which continues a little bit into 0.3 volt and then at the edge it keeps evolving because of the deformation but at the center it kind of stabilizes also in the second cycle there is not really much change in the roughness at the center but like if you see like the edge keeps evolving which is mainly due to all the deformation that is happening or which is focused in the edge region of the island so this gives also that how SEI morphology changes in if the SEI is on a surface which goes through a lot of volume changes so this is a good understanding of SEI layer and now what we wanted to do is that we wanted to do a even higher resolution of SEI layer so what we did initially we were uh, imaging at 20 by 20 micrometer uh, dimension of the scan so we reduced the scan size to 7 micrometer by 7 micrometer so that we can really focus on the corner crack and on the edge cracks and see how they evolve as we cycle the sample so this is a third this is during the third cycle and you can see it is a high resolution image and the voltage is again mentioned at the top so how these cracks evolve as we cycle so what you can see is that because there is amount of expansion these cracks again open up and these cracks kind of close down as we sorry as we deleted the sample one important thing to note from this figure is that after delithiation you have like material build up at these crack sites this could be so this is like at the just the crack site there is huge amount of uh, material build up which is due maybe when it is delithiating you have a compressive stress which could buckle the material at the crack site and can result in a little buckling but not spoliation spoliation means it is not really coming off of the substrate but still it is like there is a little bit of buckling that we can notice from this slide so like now what we can do is like we can take this image and all these images and have a section which is like somewhere like at the edge crack site and see really that how this crack really evolved in terms of its height or in terms of its opening so what I am plotting on the right side of this slide is the height profile at a particular same section so what you can see is that around 0.2 volt we started developing this crack and this crack uh, we are also increasing the height which I am not showing in terms of numbers but what you can really see right now is that how these cracks marked with the red arrows are evolving so you can see that there is a shift in the crack as we are lithiating further to 0.05 volt which really shows that the island surface is sliding island surface at the uh, copper current collector is sliding which causes it to expand and more open up the crack which is going inside deeper into the SEI layer and what you can see is that after we completely delithiated the sample there was a build up of the material which is which is most probably due to buckling or there is new SEI formation so which was clear from this earlier slide so now 
there is a lot of information that we can quantify from this crack opening and crack height kind of geometries. So what we can do first is try to calculate that how much strain is there in the SEI layer. Although we can calculate that there is total of 10% lateral expansion, but like we want to calculate how much local strain is there. So we are interested in the local strain in the SEI layer. So for that, what we can do is like, based on these AFM images, we can track the features and how those features evolved or like got sifted during lithiation. So what, what I did was I tracked different features. So if you could see like in the first slide, there are all these features in the height profile. So I can track these features as, they, as I evolve during cycling. So based on that, I can track how much displacement is going on. So 1.5 volt, everything is at zero. That is the reference point. And then I see that at 0.2 volt, how, where those features went. So I can calculate the displacement. And now if I can use a very simple strain equation, which is epsilon strain is equal to du by dx or del u by del x, which is the how much, uh, how much local strain is there. So what we can notice is that if we just fit a, uh, linear kind of approximation to the edge region, which is like really after four micrometer, we can get that there is a 15% strain at 0.2 volts, and there is almost 32% strain at 0 0.05 volt, which is like cutoff voltage for lithiation. So what we have now is the strain in the SEI layer. So what we can do with this? So what we can come up to is fracture toughness calculation. These kind of parameters, as Ching Ching mentioned, are very important for understanding of lithium ion batteries and how SEI re really evolves or how we can uh, design a SEI which can withstand higher strains in different kinds of materials, high capacity materials. So what we can, what we have for energy release rate is these kind of standard, very conventional equations where we need to know the stress in the material, the height of the film, the elastic modulus or plane strain elastic modulus of the film, which is a CI layer here. And there is a non-dimensional parameter here, which depends on elastic mismatch parameters, which are alpha and beta, which are called Dundas parameters. And there is like, if the, cra if the crack is evolving like this, we have the uh, length of the crack versus the height of the film. So although in this uh, measurement, we didn't really focus on measuring the elastic modulus of the material because our main focus was seeing the crack failure, we can still take into account from the published results that where the SEI elastic modulus falls, mainly like whatever has been reported till now, it falls from 10 MPa, which is actually mostly uh, the organic part of the SEI layer and like 5,000 MP or 5 GPA, which shows kind of uh, uh, elastic properties of uh, the inner part, which is like uh, the inorganic part. Although like I'm just considering this part, but there has been reports of ACI elastic modulus even higher, like 60 GPA or 50 GPA, which is like really very inorganic parts of the ACI layer. So based on this information, we can calculate alpha and beta Dundas parameters based on, I'm not showing all those equations because those are not very important for this discussion right now, but we can calculate where these alpha and beta parameters fall and what is the correlation that we see in uh, beta and alpha by alpha. So this kind of correlation. So based on these uh, information and what has been published in terms of energy release rate from Hutchinson and Suo papers or Plasek from uh, Harvard, we can calculate where does where would this uh, non-dimensional parameter fall in terms of its number. Now, once we have this, we already calculated strain. We already calculated strain from the succession of AFM images. And now, as as you can see from this AFM height profile at 0.2 volt and 0.05 volt, we have some kind of number for what is the thickness of the crack how much it has penetrated into the SEI layer as we are cycling the material. So we have A by H also. So based on all this information combined, what we can get is 
what a, a kind of bound on the energy release rate which gives us a measurement of fracture energy of the material. So you can see is that based on this uh, ACI modulus numbers we can really calculate where would this fracture energy lie in the spectrum. So this is like very much uh, like falls into the reason where we talk about uh, in terms of like various thin films or like various materials, composite materials. So it is a very good uh, and uh, kind of accurate measurement of SEI fracture toughness or fracture energy calculations. So another thing that I wanted to mention was during the first cycle there has been discussed a lot of papers which talk about two phase lithiation. So what you can really see is that during, so like at 0.3 volt during the first cycle we have this kind of contrast difference which really shows you can see the uh, direction of the arrows which talks about which says that how we are scanning and as we are going down like scanning means it is lithiating you can see that there is a front which moves inside the material from the edge region which is really representing the lithiated part which is like a lighter color and the still like amorphous lithium which is like the darker higher contrast region and how it is evolving with respect to like different scans. So it is like completely going in by the scan 3. And on the right side what I am plotting is that how the height of this uh, island is changing with respect to this two phase lithiation. So based on this information what we can really calculate is the phase front velocity. So like how what is the velocity of this phase front into the material which was estimated to be 2.2 nanometer per second which agrees very well with earlier measurement of Anton Tokarnov and also like some other papers based on in situ TEM studies. So now like what we wanted to really see is that what happens like if these crack we saw these kind of cracking in the corner region and in the edge region how it what happens like after 7 or 10 cycles. So we image like after seven cycles what happened to this same island that I have showed you earlier. So what you can see is that there has been lot of further failure and like you can see in the edge region really it kind of detached or like there was because of buckling and cracking it got detached from the edge region of the island which shows that there is a severe uh, uh, cracking and delamination problem due to this kind of volume expansion and contraction and this kind of in situ AFM studies gives a, gives a good, good understanding of how this ACI layer really fails. So now I will come to the conclusion slide. So lithium ion battery is a complex material and engineering system and uh, in situ and in operando correct characterization at the nanoscale is important or required to reveal the dominant factors governing battery lifetime and performance which are very much related to how the SEI layer evolves. Brooker AFMs with peak force tapping and glove box integration provides a versatile solution for lithium ion battery research. With high resolution AFM scanning we were able to observe for the first time failure of the SEI layer and how it evolved during cycling. Now with this observation we were able to calculate the critical strain at which this failure starts and also estimate a bound on fracture energy which will be very useful in understanding mechanics of the SEI layer. So in terms of acknowledgement I really acknowledge, acknowledge General Motors, Brooker and Brown and funding from DOE BMR program battery materials research and I thank my supervisor Professor Brian Sheldon. I thank Anton Tokarno who was there to help me with the experiments at Brooker and Thomas and Chen Cheng from Brooker for allowing me to use their facility to carry out these interesting experiments. Thanks a lot and thank you to all for hearing me. Well, uh, thanks to all our three uh, speakers. This is uh, Thomas Mueller again. I'll have a quick look at the questions that were submitted so far. If you uh, have additional questions, don't hesitate to submit them in the uh, questions dialog box. 
let me have a quick look. Okay, I see we have we had some some very early questions already. So um, I'm going to uh, read those and and then go through the list. Um, we still have about ten minutes to to cover questions. Um, if you you know have more questions, we'll also follow up with uh, with emails. So um, something that came in very early. Uh, we had mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that uh, this work was performed on a uh, dimension uh, fast scan slash icon platform. Um, and the first question is is asking whether this would also be feasible with a uh, multi-mode AFM, and if so, what what ProPoder to use? Uh, Teddy, maybe you have a comment on it. Okay, so I believe you've been running this non-aqueous ECFM measurement on a multi-mode AFM, and that if the AFM is also housed inside a glove box. Um, I mean, unfortunately, with the current easy accessory for the multiple AFM that we have, it is very challenging. I mean, it has both the instrument, the instrument safety, and the technical uh, difficulties because we are talking about uh, organic solvent and then inside the, the multiple. So, I mean, we can we can talk offline for more details. So, uh, but I can see the te the technical uh, difficulties, but I don't see any fundamental limitation. And uh, as for the second question, I mean, for as long as for liquid imaging, no matter if in aqueous or in organic solvent, you always need a probe holder that is designed for freeze imaging. For non-aqueous solution, you also need to consider the chemical compatibility of the EC cell and probe holder with your with your uh, uh, with your um, solvent with your solution. I mean, I can send you the list of chemical compatibility of uh, our our uh, multi-mode probe holder and ET cell, if you shoot me an email after the uh, webinar. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Teddy. Yeah, so in short, right, we, we have the glove box integration for the multi-mode. There is an EC cell. It is a bit of different EC cell due to the, the size of the multi-mode. We have really developed this uh, large and, and uh, battery EC cell on the on the ICON platform, yes. making use of that large and open platform for that. Mm -hmm. That's why that's why we did uh, prefer that. Um, there's a second question also from the same person. Um, about the, the kind of tip um, as, uh, or, or actually cantilever, the spring constant that's most suitable for our imaging of the SEI layer that we performed. I don't know if either Teddy or maybe Ravi wants to. Uh, uh, I can get started. Yeah. So, I mean, in the first, um, so first we have had two webinars about AFM Pro fundamental selection and application. Uh, you can check out, you can check them out on our webinar website. You can also contact our service team for more training material about what kind of probe you should use for a specific material. I mean, long story short for this question, for soft and fragile material, you would like to use a soft cantilever with high force sensitivity. If the spring constant is too high, that is, if the cantilever is too, too steep, you will lose the control on the low force. Ravi can command on what type of probe he used, but I assume it should be something around like a 0.5 newton per meter or less for the peak force tapping. Yeah, Ravi, do you have any further comment on it? Um, maybe you're on mute at the moment. Yeah, I can comment. Yeah, yeah. So I can comment. So what I used was MLCT kind of tips, which are like silicon cantil uh, silicon nitride cantilever with silicon nitride tip, and the spring constant was 0 0.6 nano newton per meter, and the tip radius was like 20 nanometers. So this is the tip that I used for this. Yeah, so there's another thing you need to you need to be uh, cautious with because uh, today a lot of probes that when they are used in the air they have aluminum coating to increase the uh, the laser refraction. But aluminum coating is, is normally is not compatible with liquid, so you need to look for something either uncoating or coat with some some inert material like gold. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, so that's also why this is a good match. Yeah, and peak for stopping can handle the low spring constants. Yes, yeah. on uh, resonance. Um, the third question, uh, also from uh, the the same uh, uh, researcher, on uh, would we be able to evaluate the conductivity of the SEI layer using conductive AFM? Well, this is really a really good question, and it's actually not straightforward to answer. So, okay, as what I mentioned, the tip sample ensemble of the AFM measurement. I mean, you can you can you can construct the tip sample ensemble as electro electrical component into a circuit. Then you can measure different electrical properties using an AFM. Measuring conductivity of a material at a nano scale in dry system or in non-conducting, non-conducting liquid. It's very straightforward. And we already have different AFM modes for it. For example, uh, SS, uh, scan, uh, SSRM, conductive AFM, tuner, and, 
And then all, I mean, this mode, all these modes already integrated with our pick four typing technique. However, if you if you are, if you would like to measure the SEI conductivity in situ and even in operando, that like what we show here, um, which is measure. So now, um, so that is, I mean, measuring the tip sample current in the conductive liquid. You definitely, you definitely need an insulated probe that only has the tip end exposed. Because you, in this measurement, you have to decouple the tip sample contact current from the current that caused by ionic conduction and any EC process that happens on the tip surface. We do have the PIT SECM product, which is scanning electrochemical microscopy that are about to release. And that uh, SECM package is suited for this work. But so far, again, I mean, this SECM uh, is only work on our icon system. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe in, in, in short, because the SEI layer is fragile, the peak force tuna more yeah. could be very suitable. Yes. Do it in situ, which is probably how you want to do it. Um, an AFM SECM package, which uh, you, you maybe will hear from us about uh, in, the, in the future, yes. is, is what you really need in conjunction with peak force tuna. On a dimension icon slash fast scan with the EC accessory that we uh, that we showed you today. So this is actually a very interesting question. So interesting that uh, uh, somebody thought of that. Um, and, and next question, um, um, uh, asking uh, Ravi in particular, have you performed similar experiments with uh, uh, silicon islands of different thickness? Um, and uh, um, and secondly, if your lateral forces um, in in contact mode, oh, let's see, what do I say? Well, second question would be if you see different lateral forces in a contact mode experiment um, as a function of position when you would look at the edge or the center of the island. Uh, Ravi, could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, so the, for the first question, which is on whether I have looked at uh, different thicknesses, so during this trip, or during this experiment, I was mainly focusing on thicker island because Anton, in his previous paper, which has been there in this uh, presentation, he looked at uh, thinner islands, which were like 50 nanometer thick. So yes, we have looked at a different thickness island, although not in a spectrum, but mainly 50 nanometer and 200 nanometer. Why we chose this thicker island is mainly due to the sear lag model that I mentioned. So the sear lag reason is the sear lag reason is dependent on what thickness of my island is. So because thicker island will have higher sear lag reason and there will be more lateral sliding, that's why we wanted to use this thick island. And uh, the second question, which relates to whether I use different lateral force when scanning. So uh, during the scanning, I had fixed the peak force. Uh, to be one nanonewton or two nanonewton. I didn't modify to image like, I didn't modify this force to scan in the different reasons, but uh, um, I'm not sure whether that is required even because like using this kind of one nanonewton or two nanonewton kind of force, it is already very low and that doesn't affect the SEI layer in terms of scratching as Teddy also mentioned. You have to go to like 10 nanonewtons or higher to really affect the SEI layer. So I suppose like using this kind of force is okay to study both uh, uh, edge reason and the center reason of the island. Maybe to add to that, while we directly specify the force in peak force tapping, since we move in and out, we actually uh, sort of intentionally avoid lateral forces in this mode, which is probably critical for that fragile SEI layer. Uh -huh. um, so we, we I guess intentionally didn't exert lateral forces uh, from the from the imaging tip. We we didn't right. perform contact mode on it, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I use peak force tapping. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and in fact, there's a, a another question, maybe somewhat related to it. Well, what's the difference between peak force tapping and uh, traditional tapping and contact modes? Um, what are um, what are its advantages? Um, um, okay. So. Um, um, Tapping mode, uh, okay, so the traditional tapping mode oscillates the probe at its fundamental resonance. So as the probe moves across the surface, and you, uh, as we know, it continuously and very quickly moves in and out of the contact of the surface. I mean, it's essentially that's the that's intermittent tapping motion. 
I mean, in tapping mode, the feedback signal, in conventional tapping mode, the feedback signal is the tapping amplitude, which depends on the tip sample distance. So when you're doing the topography, the feedback system is to maintain the constant amplitude of the oscillation. And surface property can affect the phase of the mechanical oscillation and resonance. So one can also get a, something called like a phase signal to roughly, to roughly differentiate different surface domain. However, for peak force tapping, we do not oscillate the tip at the resonant frequency. Instead, we oscillate the tip at an of resonant low frequency, one to two kilohertz. So the oscillation does not rely on the resonant frequency on the, on, of the cantilever. In peak force tapping, we have a direct force control on the tip sample contact force. And on the conventional tapping mode, we don't. And this direct force control gives us stable AFM imaging and more in and, and more inert to the environmental perturbation. In particular, um, uh, peak four tapping is very convenient over the, uh, the conventional tapping mode when you're running the experiment in liquid, in temperature, dependent imaging, and even in, um, in like a, a vacuum system. So, and then because we are getting triggered force curve at every pixel, as I mentioned, I mean, this allows us to simultaneously collect mechanical properties that direct, uh, directly correlated with the surface topography. And this is very different from the conventional contact mode, which, which can only get a phase signal. You have no idea what happened. But here, we specifically know the mechanical property. And I'm glad that um, Rob is showing the, uh, the backup slide here. Because when, whenever you ask me to compare the advantage, six advantage over these three uh, fundamental AFM imaging mode, uh, this is a nice table to summarize them. And then, I mean, it's very easy to end up a lecture to, uh, to like spend like half an hour, like half an hour, 45 minutes to explain all the, all the details. But yes, uh, after we uh, put the, uh, the slide, um, this slide on the website, you can take a look carefully. And also this, this, this table is actually indeed coming from one of our paper. If you're interested, you can send me an email, I can send you a, uh, this paper talking about all the basic AFM and also some advanced application modes. Very good, and we'll leave the slide up maybe a, a little longer okay. for, for this question. Thanks, uh, Teddy. Uh, another question I, I came in, do you think a perfectly spherical silicon nanoparticle would have um, less or would have the least SEI cracks? I don't know if uh, Teddy or maybe Ravi or uh, who, who would have a comment on this. Do you think the spherical uh, geometry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's still like what is important here is the deformation, amount of deformation or amount of strain you are putting on the SEI layer. So um, I would still think that whether it is perfect spherical particle where, or whether it is not, uh, not a perfect spherical particle, you will still have this uh, failure of SEI layer due to strain that you, we are putting due to the expansion and contraction. And it also depends on the feature side of the sample. If you have something pretty flat, um, and then of course a, a sphere, a, a, a colloidal probe might work better. But thinking about that, the uh, the SEI layer is quite rough. They always have this kind. Of, I, I assume they always have this kind of spiky uh, surface feature, and then the sphere won't help much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question here. Would the AFM SECM that we mentioned be able to answer the question which parts of the SEI are more or less conductive than others? Uh, so let me let me get started with this question. So again, uh, um, for this for the for the project we're showing here, we are doing EC AFM. So EC and AFM they're separate. So we're pretty much just doing AFM uh, during the uh, EC reaction. That is, the AFM tip is not involved with any electrochemical. Uh, 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 ma uh, uh, reaction and also it's not intended to measure any conductivity. Again, if you really want to do this kind of like uh, electrochemical reactivity measurement, uh, if you want to use the tip as one of the electrical, electro, electrochemical, electro, you have to go to um, uh, a setup like a more similar to SECM, uh, SECM uh, configuration. For conductivity, <coughs> of course, you can use this tip directly measure the, uh, the electrical current. For the uh, electrochemical reactivity, you have to go with the scanning electrochemical microscopy. It's interesting that uh, in this year, early this year, uh, there are already like a few papers uh, from the Truman's lab that use the conventional scanning electrochemical microscopy to image the uh, the uh, the uh, chemical reactivity across the surface. However, because they're using the uh, conventional SECM, they only have a resolution on the on the scales of a few microns or, or worth. So. 
for the Pickford SECM package that we are going to release because it's based on AFM. So we suppose it is to be get to the resolution that even better than 100 nanometer. So yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Teddy. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, another question about uh, the the maximum in situ experiment duration. When you had this experiment set up, how how long were you able to run this and and, and cycle the the anode? Um, how long were you able to to run this experiment? I assume at some point um, the tip maybe got contaminated or, or there was evaporation or maybe there wasn't evaporation because the cell was closed. Um, okay. How, how long did you perform this experiment? Yes, Ravi? Yes, I will answer this question. So like uh, we used to image like for the whole day. So like we will start in uh, like 12 hours or so. We will scan with the same tip and uh, after 12 hours of experiment experimentation, we didn't see any uh, anything wrong with the tip, but we still change for the next experiment just to make sure because uh, uh, still change it for the next experiment. So, and there was no evaporation of the electrolyte at all because Ed Teddy showed before in his slide a boot which is made of calrays is like closing the cell completely. So there is no evaporation. So we always see no crystallization or uh, evaporation of the electrolyte. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Um, uh, also, um, did you perform any uh, a separate nano indentation study on the SEI layer? Um, I have not yet, but uh, that is on the plan. Uh, as I mentioned, right now I was considering different elastic modulus range values from the literature. But we can do these kind of, uh, based on peak force tapping itself, we can get some measurement of elastic modulus values. So that is on plan, but I have not done it yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe more for Teddy. This is a glove box integrated dimension um, icon. Um, is, um, is this glove box integration useful for other electrical modes? For example, if you do a conductive AFM, uh, scanning capacitance or other measurements, do you do you know does the glove box have advantages there? Yes, I mean um, it has a lot of advantages. So I mean, if you if you look look in the, our manual, you can see that in the air we say that um, our electrical measurement not typically like uh, have a resolution about 20 nanometer. But if you run it in a glove box, you will you can get something like a that like a, the resolution with like a few uh, nanometer. I mean, I, I uh, like a one nanometer or even be, uh, even better. So why is why the uh, glove box technique integrate with the uh, electrical measurement has this kind of like an advantage, because when you are doing the experiment in ambient in the air, right, the sample surface always has a layer of liquid, but most of them is actually moisture like water. So when you approach the tip to the surface and apply the voltage, you are running electrochemistry locally there. This will blur out your electrical uh, electro electrical uh, signals. So and then we have a one webinar uh, on, the, on our website. You can see that we can our SSIM in Gabbo can achieve the resolution has a, like a, a 0.5 nanometer, which is five angstrom. Uh, angstrom. I would encourage you to take a look at that webinar. And uh, in the inside webinar, uh, our, uh, our our scientists and also our collaborator explain in detail why the Gabbo is is better. It's uh, it's better for electrical measurement over the over the measurement that in the air. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Uh, one more, um, there's a question on the preparation of these interesting silicon samples. What substrate are they on and uh, how is this mounted in the electrochemical cell? Um, may maybe Ravi has some comment on okay. that. Uh, yes, let me show this slide which was, which I can show, uh, which is a very good slide for, yeah, here. So the sample substrate that we are using, it's a quartz vapor, uh, which is like 40, uh, 40 mm by 40 mm dimension and 500 micrometer thick. What we do to prep, prep the sample is we have a titanium 20 nanometer of bonding layer and we use copper as current collector which is 200 nanometer thickness. And then using photolithography which is a S1, S1813 kind of uh, photoregist, we make this kind of pattern island based on a hard mask. So the geometry of the amorphous silicon island is like 15 micrometer by 15 micrometer and the thickness is 225 nanometer. So this is the sample geometry and the substrate that we used. And the mounting of the sample 
So what you see is that there is a bottom plate, stainless steel, and then this is the sample. So this is, the, this is like how we just put in, and you see uh, in this assembled picture, this is how it will look like as like sample. It is not flowing lithium here, but uh, there is another picture which can show you how the sample mounting will look like. So lithium on the top, and then this is the substrate, although it is showing a small sample, but we had like 40 mm by 40 mm sample, which would go out of the sample a little bit, of the cell a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Yeah, so it's really so sandwiched in the bottom between the bottom plate and the yeah. and the ring, yes. right? Yeah. So there's a point I want to add. So uh, as a, as a Robbie is showing the uh, um, the small sample, yeah, our our EC cell is uh, is has the flexibility on on the, on different sides of the sample. That's one thing I want to add. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, we we also have a small sample. Yeah, we have a small cell adapter that allows you to use different uh, sample stuff. And, and uh, you might also see in this, this uh, thank you, Ravi, for showing this slide. You can uh, take off the bottom independently of take, taking off the top part, right? So changing either the sample or um, the electrode or the glass plate on top. That is Intentionally screw from two different sides to yeah. one or the other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ravi and Teddy. Um, uh, we, we do have uh, quite a few more questions, but I have already run over our lot of time. So um, I want to thank everybody for attending. Again, uh, we'll make sure to follow up on the remaining questions via email. Don't hesitate to uh, contact us with more questions also if they come up. And um, yeah, thank you for, your, for attending. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, soon uh, in our next webinar. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.